Okay, welcome back to the uh, global lab session. So, for those of you who are assembled, uh, I would like to briefly discuss uh, some of the issues which uh, went into designing a near diagram for uh, the two uh, example scenarios which we have. The first example scenario is a railway system and here we have listed a number of things which we would like to uh, model. Okay, if you see the uh, problem statement here, it says uh, we want to model stations, tracks which connect stations, train schedules, passengers and after we do the ER diagram, we have to uh, transform it into a set of tables. Now, this is highly simplified. So, one of the things I want to do is uh, discuss A, the solutions which uh, we have uh, made available and B, what are the assumptions which we made to simplify it and how we could go around uh, extending it to a more realistic scenario. The reason I simplified it is that this whole thing the two exercises both had to be done in just over two hours of your time and that is fairly short. So, we had to keep things simple. So, first of all uh, starting with uh, stations clearly each station would be an entity there is no doubt about it. Uh, clearly each train would be an entity there is no doubt about that. Now, the next uh, thing in that list is tracks. So, a track connects uh, two stations in our simplified world. In reality, it is more complex. Tracks can have uh, junctions at various places uh, uh, and a realistic system has to model these kinds of situations where there are two tracks in parallel and certain places along the tracks where you have points which let a train move from one track to another uh, going in one direction. Um, and so, there is a lot of complexity in really modeling a track system uh, between a pair of stations in Mumbai there may be four or even six tracks in certain situations with a lot of interconnections. So, it is a fairly complex situation, but to keep life simple we said let us just have a single pair of tracks a sing single track between any two stations. In this simplified world uh, where there is nothing else in between it's just a edge connecting two stations, uh, we can model a track as a relationship between two stations. And if you wish to add any extra information such as the distance between the two stations, you can add it to the track relation which will record how far the stations are from each other along the track. So, uh, let me show you the uh, relevant part of the solution. Okay. If you look down here, we have a station and then a track which is a relationship between two stations. Uh, if we needed to bother about directionality and other things, we would have to provide uh, labels for these edges, um, but in a simplified view we are not going to bother about all that. But if you want to make it more realistic, if we want to model the presence of multiple tracks between a pair of stations, what do we do? Uh, one possible approach is to add a multi-valued attribute to the track which says between these two stations here are uh, you know possibly multiple tracks with one attribute set for each of those tracks. That could be useful, but maybe it makes more sense not to model track as a relationship. Why not model it as an entity itself uh, maybe even a segment of a track could be the smallest piece of this uh, puzzle. So, maybe we can mod model a uh, smallest segment of a track that is between any two points. So, between those two points is a continuous object and we can model that as an entity. So, if we do this what happens we have entities which are track segments. Now, we need to know how track segments connect to each other and uh, how they connect to stations. So, let us uh, do this on uh, the whiteboard and uh, in just a little bit, but before we switch to the whiteboard let me wrap up the rest of the basic design which you would have done. So, coming back to the problem specification, we need to model uh, train schedules and trains 
So, the train schedule in our simplified world records at what time a train passes through each station on its route. And uh, we again made life even easier for you by assuming that all trains finish within the same day. Why do we do this? Uh, that should be obvious because if a train starts on one day and continues through the next day, we have to model which day it starts and maybe that will be day 0 by default. And the timings along the route have to include not only the time of arrival and departure, but also the date relative to the starting date. So, day 0 is the starting date, day 1 in the case of some very long distance trains in India, day 2 or 3 maybe even. Or if you are in Russia in the Trans-Siberian Railway, maybe it goes up to day 7 or so I am told. So, we ignored that, but we could have modeled it by adding in addition to uh, the time, the day. So, if you see the Indian railway schedule, in fact, they do this. Uh, they have a day in addition to the time. So, then we are modeling the time in and time out. <coughs> and finally, we need to know what is the sequence. Uh, we can always get the sequence by sorting on time, but it helps to um, keep a sequence number to see which are the adjacent stations in a route. So, what we did in our sample solution is to have a train associated with a station and so that is a relationship travels through which links a train and a station. Now, what are the attributes of that uh, relationship? We have got a sequence number, 0 means the train starts there and a time in when the train reaches that station. Now, for the very first station on the route where it starts, time in does not really have a meaning. Maybe it does if you are also worried about what time the rake, empty rake reaches the platform, but ignoring that, we can simply set time in to null and time out is the time when it starts. Then you have, a, that would be at sequence number 0 or 1. Computer scientists like to start from 0, others may start from 1. So, then you will have a sequence of uh, stations through which the train passes and each of these would have an associated sequence number. Now, if you have a train which actually does a loop and continues on, what do I mean by that? It arrives at a station, goes somewhere and then comes back to that station and continues further in its journey, not goes back, but continues further on. Uh, then you have a strange train with a loop in its journey. For such a train with a loop, something is going to go wrong with this design. What is going to go wrong? The problem is that the same train arrives at the same station at two different times and departs at two different times, has two different sequence numbers all for the same station. And we cannot model that with the diagram we have here. Uh, what we have here is a time in and time out and a sequence number which are single values. So, we cannot have a train loop back. So, this is again a simplifying assumption we have made here to keep the uh, ER diagram simple. Now, is this a realistic assumption? It is for the most part. I do not think there are very many trains which loop back, but then you never know. There are all these uh, special uh, super expensive trains which take tourists through Rajasthan or uh, Konkan and so forth. Now, I am sure some of these trains actually loop back. They depart on a particular date, go somewhere, come back and then go further to some other place. So, if you are modeling such trains, this is going to fail. So, then you would have to have uh, something slightly different. Uh, perhaps a multi-valued attribute or perhaps even you can model a particular halt of that train itself as an entity. So, when we tried this exercise uh, during the coordinator's workshop, several people actually did that, which actually makes a lot of sense in this situation, where the halt of a train is an entity by itself and the halt relates to a train. It would be a weak entity of a particular train and it would be related to a station. So, then you can easily have a loop. I will come back to that design alternative also on the whiteboard. Uh, but before getting into those alternatives, let us finish up the last piece, which is we want to track bookings for passengers. Now, in the Indian railways, uh, the railways does not really track who you are across time, across multiple bookings. It simply has a name and an age and that is it. It does not know anything more about you. Maybe it has an address, but 
if you have an airline reservation system, uh, sometimes they have a frequent flyer number and can identify you individually across multiple times in your travel. Again, we are not modeling such situations. We are going with the Indian railway model and booking simply has an ID and again, we simplified it a lot. In general, a booking has multiple people traveling together, a family or set of friends may travel together. We again simplified it to assume we are going to have a separate booking record for each person traveling. So, we have a booking, separate booking ID and then a name, a coach, a date of travel and a seat number. So, we are going to have separate entries per person and therefore, we do not have to worry about multi-valued attributes here either. Now, note that the booking is for a train and since train is an entity, we have to create a relationship from booking to train. Note also that it is a total relationship, there is a double line and there is an arrow pointing towards train because a booking can relate to only one train. You cannot have a multi-train booking in our model. Although you can imagine a flight booking which has multiple legs or a train booking. Indian Railways does not support it right, as far as I know, but uh, maybe you could do that in certain situations. We are not modeling it. The other aspect of the booking is it is bit, it starts from some station on the train's route and ends at another station on the train's route. So, you have a from and a to um, station and since station is an entity also, we have to make both of these relationships from booking to station. One of those relationships is called from and the other is called to. So, that uh, those are the two relationships. As before, we have total participation and many to one because you can have only one from station and one to station. So, that wraps up our very simple uh, railway ER model, but now let us see what are the issues if we try to add more features to it and I am going to switch over to the whiteboard at this point. Okay, first of all, let us uh, take the simpler one. Uh, which is uh, if you want to allow a train to uh, go in loops and do generally crazy things. And so, we decide to model a halt of a train as an entity. So, we have a train. I am going to uh, omit the attributes of a train because we already know what they are. Then we can have a train halt and treat it as an entity. A train halt um, has to be a weak entity because it is for a particular train. As a result, train will become the identifying entity for it. We can call it halt for perhaps. I do not know if you can read this. I wrote it a little too small. Let me try again. Halt for. That is an identifying relationship. Therefore, this has to be total and this side, this is many to one. And the train halt itself has a sequence number, which is a discriminant. Now, another issue is if we are modeling a train route in full detail, uh, we want to model not only places where it actually halts, but also places where it passes through. So, if you wish to uh, distinguish this, we have a couple of options. In our uh, schema, uh, we did not really bother too much about this. We could have just assumed it halts at every station along the route. It is the slowest passenger train on the system. It halts everywhere. Uh, but supposing it does not halt at a station, a uh, quick hack was to say that the time in and time out for that station are exactly equal. So, a minimum halt is 1 minute. If you halt less than that, if, if time in and out are exactly equal, that means it does not halt at all. Uh, if you wish to make this more explicit, uh, we can have uh, maybe not a train halt we could call this something slightly different. We can have a train through, passes through or something like that. And then we can have a flag called halts. That is a boolean which says whether it halts or not. And then time in as before, time out. Okay. So far so good, but this is obviously related to a station. So, we have a station.
Okay, sorry for that interruption. The battery died out on me. So, to repeat what I was just saying towards the very end, uh, a train halt is obviously associated with a station. Therefore, we introduce a relationship between a train halt and a station and that relationship is one in which a train halt has to have total participation uh, because a halt has to be presumably at a station. If you want to model halts you know at some point along the route which is not a station, we may want to go further, but let us ignore that. And so, a train halt is total participation for train uh, halt in halt at and each train halt is at only one station. Therefore, you have a many to one relationship with station. Okay. So, now if you have a train which does a loop, there is no problem. There will be one in, uh, weak entity instance for the first time it comes into that with some sequence number and the second time it again comes to the same station, it will be with a different sequence number and that can be modeled perfectly well. Okay, so, that took care of one part of it. The second part is the track itself. Now, if you noticed, we just said that there is one track between any pair of stations and if you think about this, if you are familiar with the data structure graph, the graph data structure, that basically has nodes which correspond to our stations and edges which link a pair of nodes. So, what we have done in our design uh, where um, track is simply a relationship between two edges is model an edge of a sorry a track is a relationship between two stations is basically a edge between two nodes in the uh, terminology of uh, the graph data structure. So, what we are saying is that a graph data structure can be modeled as a ER diagram. You can translate this to a set of tables and so you can actually populate a graph in a database, model a graph in a database. Now, when we have multiple edges and so on, it is more than a graph, uh, some multi graph and uh, we can still model that. So, let us uh, try to do that. Supposing we have a station, uh, to another station you have multiple tracks. Uh, now, presumably uh, the railway system would have given names to those tracks. So, you have tracks. So, a track has to become an entity now not a relationship because for a given pair of stations there may be many tracks between them and really each track has an its own existence. In fact, there are good reasons to model as an entity. For example, different tracks may have different speed limits based on when they were built. So, maybe there is even a record of when the track was laid and when it is due for maintenance, when it is due for replacement and so forth. So, a, we are going to model a track segment to be precise. It is a segment of a track as an entity, that is the name of the entity and it can have attributes, perhaps it has an ID. Let us make it a strong entity because we cannot really associate a track with one of the stations or the other. So, let us just give it a unique ID, globally unique ID and then we have station which is also an entity. So, a track uh, in our current model, we may even want to model interchanges between tracks in between stations, uh, but let us throw that out to keep our life simple. So, now we have a track segment, we have a station and the track segment connects two stations. So, basically it has a relationship called connects. A track segment connects two stations. Well, how do we uh, put a constraint that it connects exactly two stations. So, one way to do it is to put a participation uh, cardinality constraint here 2 dot dot 2. So, what that means is every track segment here must participate twice in the connects relationship and that will correspond to the two stations. Should a station have a track? Well, uh, when a, a railway system is under construction, it is possible that there is a station without any track coming to it, uh, but once it is constructed that would be rather odd. So, if you want to model only the state where it has actually been constructed, then it should have at least one track segment, but what is the limit? It can be fairly large. We have stations with uh, you know maybe 10, 20 tracks even. So, let us not put a constraint. 1 dot dot star will allow any number of tracks in that. Um, connecting to that one station. So, the track itself once we have modeled as an entity can have maybe speed limit. 
Now, uh, if we want to model some other situation like uh, let us say some of the tracks are directional. So, on a particular track you are only allowed to travel in one direction. If we want to model that, how do we model it in this situation? So, one way is to create two separate relationships, uh, which is uh, track uh, from and track <coughs> to, which denotes the directionality. If you want to enter that track segment, you can only uh, enter through the from relationship segment. So, maybe we can replace connect by two things from station and to station. So, a track is from a station and it is to a station. And now, we can actually put a limit that every track is has is definitely related from and to and there is only one from <coughs> station and one to station. So, we can have a pair of entities from station and to station for a track which has a direction or if we are lazy we could maybe uh, you know hack it in here uh, in the connects uh, relationship uh, we can uh, say whether it is the a tag which is from or to. So, that is an attribute that is the other alternative. If that attribute is let us say 0, maybe it means it is the from station. If it is 1, it is the to station. So, what you would end up having is maybe a track uh, segment 1 uh, connects to station 1 and the uh, attribute here from 2 is 0, which means it starts from station 1 and the same thing connects to station 2 and the tag is 1, which means the direction is to station so, we can have two uh, separate relationships here or we can have one relationship with a tag, either of these works. I am sure many of you came up with uh, some such variants and if you did, that is perfectly fine. Okay, I think I have uh, discussed the railway uh, schema enough. Now, I would like to hear back from you if there are questions on the railway schema. So, let us see if any center. Somaya apparently has a question. Let us see if Somaya is ready with the question. Somaya, over to you. Do you have a question? Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, instead of the relation, instead of the relation to and from, if it is directly added to uh, booking as an attribute or? Okay. The question is, uh, instead of having a relationship from and to, between booking and railway station, can you directly make the from station and to station as attributes of the ER diagram? The answer is no. A station is an entity and you really should not turn an entity into an attribute. So, a related entity should be connected by a relationship. In the relational schema which you construct, we are certainly going to turn the from and to as into attributes of the relation because uh, you know there is only one from station and one to station, which certainly will make it part of the booking relation. However, when we create the ER model, uh, since uh, the station is an entity, it should not be an attribute, it should be a relationship between booking and station. So, I hope that uh, answers your question. Uh, I will uh, hand the mic back to you if you see if you have any follow up question. Back to Somaya. Do you have a follow up question? You are happy with that. Okay, let us see if anybody else has a question. Looks like only Somaya still has some question. Uh, if you are asking questions through chat, go ahead, we will uh, get those and discuss those through chat. Yeah, Somaya, back to you. You seem to have a question again. Sir, I have a question related to derived attribute. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, how the derived attributes are used uh, in the uh, uh, RDBMS means uh, we are saying that uh, de derived attributes are gets the value from other attribute. Okay. So, how these uh, uh, attributes are stored and how we get the value of a derived attribute? Okay, that is a good Thank question. You, sir. If you have a derived attribute and as I said a derived attribute gets its value from the other attributes, it is not actually stored. So, the question is how do you represent this in a relational database and uh, how do you access it, how does it get its value? And the answer to that question is uh, 
a regular uh, you know bare bones relational database does not actually support derived attributes. So, the best you can do is create a function which uh, takes uh, maybe not even an SQL, maybe a function in uh, Java or something which takes the identifier the primary key and returns the value by computing it. So, the typical example is age, uh, the current age. So, why does the current age matter? Because when you travel by railway, if you are over 5, you have to buy a half ticket. If you are over, what is it, 12 or something, you have to buy a full ticket. So, the date as of the date of travel matters. So, in fact, you may not just have an age function, but you may have a function which takes a parameter age as of date to see what the age would be as of that date. So, you cannot store it, you, but you have to compute it from the date provided, may, default may be current date and the date of birth which is stored. So, if you have a database system which actually supports uh, methods in addition to attributes uh, and uh, object relational databases, uh, some of them do support it. So, then you can just define a method along with the um, uh, relation relation slash object and uh, then you define a method which does this computation and then you invoke it uh, in a query which uh, for a language which supports such objects. Uh, you will just say for example, person dot age open close which open close meaning uh, parenthesis which means uh, the method which uses the current date and computes age. Maybe there is another method which is age which is provided a particular date. So, both of those are methods, but you access them just like their regular attributes, but you may have to pass in some parameter values. But if you use a database which does not support it, tough luck, you cannot do it. But that does not mean you should not model it in the ER model. By all means, model it and then maybe you will work around by implementing the function in Java or some other language, but at least let it be part of the design. Any follow up question on that? Okay, you are looking happy with that. Now, somebody else has a question? Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Yeah, sir. Uh, actually, uh, at the time of creating trigger or uh, creating procedure, we can write create tri create or replace trigger or create or replace procedure. Mm -hmm. But at the time of creating tables, we only used to write create table. Mm -hmm. Why can't we write create or replace table? Okay. I think this question, maybe you asked this question on chat uh, earlier, I have seen this question already. Uh, I thought I answered it, but in any case, um, the create or replace is a convenient syntax uh, in uh, Oracle, uh, whereby uh, if it is present, it simply replaces the current definition. So, why would you do that? Uh, if you did not have it and you, maybe it exists already, you first have to do a drop and then you have to create again, but dropping can have uh, problems. So, if you drop a procedure, you are going to um, uh, cause a problem where if somebody uses that procedure, calls that procedure, they are now invalid. Uh, so, it may even for a table, if you have foreign key references into that table, if you drop and then create the table again, you will have problems. So, um, for tables, what we end up doing is we have uh, alter table syntax, uh, which lets you make just the changes you want to the table instead of dropping it and recreating it completely. Now, for a procedure, you have the body of the procedure and it is hard to say, you know, delete line 24 and add this text to line 23 and do this and do that. That is fairly complex, you cannot do that. So, what you want to say is, here is the new body of that procedure and use this. And the create or replace syntax basically lets you do it. If the procedure does not exist, it just creates it. If it uh, exists already, it replaces. Uh, so, maybe uh, we could have, uh, have a database system which provides it also for creating tables. So, you can say create or replace table. So, if the table already exists, it will replace it. If you see the DDL scripts uh, which we have provided, we actually have uh, two scripts, uh, one for creating and one for dropping. So, supposing uh, you created the tables, then as part of your assignments, you went around modifying the tables. Now, you want to start afresh with a new schema. Now, if it is just modifying the data, we have uh, the scripts for loading data, which first remove all tuples from the relation and then load all the tuples again fresh. That is part of the 
data loading script. For the script to create the relations on the other hand, we have uh, one which deletes and then one which creates. If we had create or replace, we would have just used that directly. Just said create or replace without having to drop and then create again. I hope that answered your question. Okay. So now, um, since we. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Can we have all the kind of cardinality limits on ternary relationship? Okay. So, can you have arbitrary cardinality constraints on ternary relationships? So, we uh, saw what happens if you put an arrow on a ternary relationship. Uh, so, that means that for a, supposing there is a single arrow, uh, let me draw it to explain it. So, we have a ternary relationship, let us say R, which is connected to E 1, E 2, and E 3. So, now if I have an arrow pointing towards E 2, uh, we could take this to mean that for a given E 1, E 3 combination, there can exist only one relationship with an E 2. Okay, so, that uh, that is the general interpretation. Now, supposing I have two arrows going to E 1 and to E 2, what does this mean? Uh, so, some books interpreted this to mean for a given E 3, there can be only one E 1 and one E 2 combination. Some others said that if you just look at this arrow head, what it means is for a given combination of the other entities, in this case E 3 and E 2, there can be only one E 1. And similarly, if you look at E 2, for a given combination of E 1 and E 3, there can be only one E 2. So, that causes some confusion. So, uh, we decided not to bother about this uh, weird uh, cases where different people are saying different things and we said that let us just assume there is only one arrow um, out of a particular ternary relationship. Then the semantics is uh, uniform across whoever has tried to define it. So, that is one approach. The other approach is instead of using arrow heads, we can put cardinality limits. So, we can say 0 dot dot 4. Now, that is a lot more clear. 0 dot dot 4 means that E 2 must participate in anywhere between 0 and 4 occurrences of the relationship R. In fact, if you have the arrow coming in, um, that is slightly different. Uh, the, the arrow coming in, what does that mean? It means for a you know particular combination of other ones, there is only 1 E 2, but I cannot say that that is 1 dot dot 1. That is different. So, it is like uh, arrow coming in is many to 1, whereas putting this limit here 1 dot dot 1 is basically saying this is the one side, it is not the many side. So, um, how to say that for this combination of E 1 and E 2, there can be only 1 E, uh, E 1 and E 3, there is only 1 E 2. How do you specify that using cardinality? You cannot put limits here or limits here to specify that for this combination there is only 1 here. So, what exactly can be expressed using these notations is slightly different. Uh, since the whole thing is a little confusing and anyway ternary relationships are rare, we just left it out of our discussion. One way is to uh, you know write it in words that this is the constraint and then maybe you can use that constraint uh, when you do the relationship uh, design. For example, when you decide what is the primary key of this uh, uh, relation which you create from the relationship this arrow would help you decide that as long as a single arrow. So, I am just going to leave ternary relationships at that. I do not know if I answered your question to full satisfaction. If you have a follow up question, you are welcome to ask. Okay, sir, I have a qu uh, question related to constraint. Uh, when, uh, for some reason, if we disable the constraint, then uh, we so, uh, do some uh, DML operation like insert, update or delete. And uh, after that, uh, when we uh, again uh, enable the constraint and if there is some uh, uh, problem with the constraint, then uh, what happens uh, to the inserted deleted or updated data? Okay. That is a good question. If you drop a constraint totally and then uh, re-enable it, 
uh, what happens if the constraint no longer holds? And the answer is that if the constraint does not hold, it will not get added to the schema, it, it will fail. So, constraint can be added only if it actually holds on the current state. However, I want to differentiate this from the thing which we discussed yesterday, which was to defer the constraint. We did not drop the constraint, we did not disable the constraint, we deferred it. What does defer mean? It does not mean defer to some arbitrary point in time, it means defer to the end of the transaction. So, the constraint is checked at the time the transaction complete is wants to finish up at the end of the transaction. At that point, if the constraint fails, the transaction is rolled back. That does not mean the constraint is not being enforced. So, the thing here is that if the constraint fails, the transaction rolls back, therefore, the constraint will continue to hold. It cannot get violated. So, deferring is different from disabling. I hope that uh, clarifies this. Okay, I think I will uh, stop taking questions for a minute. I am sure you have lots of questions, uh, but I want to quickly wrap up the second part of uh, today's lab. Oh, and before that, I want to say one more thing. Uh, this each part today also had a corresponding uh, relational schema. Uh, in the solutions we have provided, I have given you the table uh, and we have also mentioned what are the primary keys. But in reality, when you create the relational schema, you should also be including the foreign keys. Uh, we inadvertently omitted that, in, uh, that, we will add it to that solution subsequently. So, if you have the uh, email copy of the solution, uh, it does not have it. But I leave it as an exercise to figure out how to add the foreign key constraints in the relational schema. It is discussed uh, in the book. Uh, when uh, I covered it in the morning, uh, I do not remember if I mentioned it, but every time you create a relation from a relationship, there would be foreign keys into the associated entities. Every time you fold a relationship into an entity, again there would be a foreign key from that entity, uh, from that relation representing the entity to the entity on the other side of that relationship. So, every uh, relationship ends up creating foreign keys. So, that is uh, one extra part to the schema creation. So, if I can come back here. Can you? So, here are the uh, tables which we would create from that ER diagram. Uh, there is a table for booking and you will note that the last few attributes of this table are train ID from and to. Those are actually uh, references to the uh, train and the station relations. The from and to are both foreign keys referencing station, train ID is a foreign key referencing train. Uh, the other ones are all straightforward. Uh, track has station ID 1, station ID 2 to indicate what it connects. Uh, travels through is also straightforward. The attributes of the relationship have all become attributes of the corresponding relation travels through. Sequence number, time in and time out, if you go back here. Time in, time out and sequence number are all attributes of travels through. So, travels through has the primary key of train, primary key of station and these three attributes, which is how we landed up with train ID, station ID, sequence number, time in and time out. Okay, so, that was straightforward. Now, let us come to an ER diagram for this database workshop modeling a resource center, uh, center coordinators um, and uh, capacity, faculty who will be attending and the associated institutions for all faculty. So, the solution to that, I will show you the ER diagram again. This is again a fairly simple ER diagram. Each resource center is obviously an entity. Each faculty member is obviously an entity. Each institute where the uh, people come from is obviously an entity. And those are the only three entities over here. Uh, we have also this uh, relationship uh, of who is the coordinator for a particular resource center. So, that is a faculty member. Uh, who is attends at a particular resource center, that is a faculty member. Uh, note that we perhaps could have merged resource center and institute. Uh, resource center is basically where the, uh, you are all meeting for this and institute is where you belong. Now, why did we keep it separate? Um, I do not have a good idea, but perhaps this was to model the situation 
where you can have a resource center which is not associated with any institute. But in this particular course, I think every resource center is an institute. So, in reality, there is no need to separate these. So, then uh, belongs to, attends and coordinates are all going to be relationships between faculty and institute. So, then the diagram would be extremely simple in that case. Uh, now, a resource center is, well, one way to look at why it is not an institute is uh, maybe it is a sub part of an institute. So, because it has a capacity, an institute like uh, IIT or NITs have thousands of students, um, but a resource center is basically in a particular room, it has a capacity constraint which is specified. So, perhaps a resource center can be identified as a weak entity related to institute perhaps or maybe even as a strong entity which is related to an institute where it resides. So, there are other possibilities here which we did not explore, but some of you may have done that. If you did, that is perfectly fine. So, that was the fairly simple ER diagram. Coming back to the schema uh, which we generate from it, you notice that we have resource center as a table, faculty as a table coordinator attends our tables. Now, perhaps we could have folded uh, these two relationships, coordinator and attends into the uh, faculty member. Now, if we come back to this diagram, you will notice that the relationships are many to one from faculty to resource center. So, it would have been easy enough to have one, two more attributes for faculty. One is attends and another is coordinates, uh, which uh, contain the ID of the resource center. So, we could have got rid of two relations and turned them into attributes in the relational design. In the year diagram, they have to be relationships. In the relational <coughs> design, we could have folded them in. Why did we not fold them in? For a couple of reasons. First, um, not all faculty are coordinators and not all faculty attend resource centers. So, it is not a total participation. Uh, so, the moment you have a non-total participation, you get null values. So, to avoid that, um, we decided to keep them as separate relations. So, what this means is coming back here, coordinator will only have tuples for those faculty who are actually coordinators and similarly, attends has things only for those who are attending at a center. So, now if I want to see how many coordinators are there, I can run a simple query, uh, select count star from coordinator. In contrast, if I had coordinator uh, off as an attribute of faculty, I would have to say select count star from faculty where coordinator off is not null and so forth. So, I have to deal with null values. Null values always cause trouble. So, it is this schema is probably better. In contrast, a faculty member has to be associated with an institute. Therefore, we folded the faculty member belongs to institute relationship into an institute ID field of faculty. And finally, uh, the question last part was uh, if you have clicker questions to be modeled and answers submitted by people to be modeled, how do we do this? Uh, so, first of all, a question can be thought of as an entity on its own. It has several attributes. It does not make question cannot be a relation. What does it relate? Nothing. It exists in the abstract by itself. So, a question we decided to model as an entity. Now, we already have people uh, who are participating, faculty, and so a faculty member may submit an answer to a question. Now, they can answer a question only once, they do not get multiple items. Uh, so, we just have to record one answer for a faculty member responding to a particular question. So, what we did is uh, come up with this ER diagram. The left hand part is exactly the same as what we already saw. The right hand part is what is new. So, the clicker quiz question is a new entity identified by an ID. Each question has an ID. Um, then we have a question text, the four choices which we have been making available. If you want a fifth choice, you have to add one more attribute. And then a correct answer, which is what is the correct answer for this question, assuming only one answer is correct. 
So, that is an entity by itself, completely uh, described entity. Now, a uh, faculty member attending this workshop submits an answer to a question. Um, so, um, you can have actually uh, this has a slight problem. This arrowhead should not have been there. I apologize for that error. Um, this is uh, many to one. Okay, <laughs> if it's many to one, uh, many faculty members can answer one question, but one faculty member cannot answer multiple questions. So that is obviously an error that got in inadvertently. Please delete this arrow here from submits answer to to click a question, remove the arrow. Okay, so it's a many-to-many -many, uh, relationship, and further, when the person has answered a question, we have to record what was the answer. Can't just say answered and not know what is the answer. So the answer choice becomes a attribute of uh, the submits answer to relationship. So that is fairly straightforward. Um, then we have the last part, which is converting this to tables. And that is also straightforward. We would have a table for clicker quiz question and a table for submits answer. The submits answer table would have faculty ID, uh, clicker question ID, and answer choice, three attributes. So that is also straightforward. So that uh, wraps up the basic set of questions we had for today. And I will take a little bit of uh, time for questions. So that this has the last part. Oh, one other thing I want to mention. Uh, the, there is a tutorial on how to use dia to draw these diagrams. And there is also a sample uh, dia file, which you can use to um, modify. You copy, modify. We had sent these instructions to coordinators. Hopefully, they have communicated it to you. But otherwise, whenever Moodle at IIT is back, you can come and see it. There are two ways of uh, modeling uh, entities in dia because our notation does not quite match existing notations. So, um, for newer versions of dia, there is something called a database uh, module, which has uh, a relation construct inside it. So, we have used that. Now, if you look at the left of each attribute here, there is a little mark. That mark really indicates whether that attribute is nullable or not. There is no way to remove that. So, that does show up in the uh, diagram here. Um, in contrast, uh, the sample dia file which we have provided also shows you how to use the entity uh, in the, the, the class rather in the UML class to model an uh, entity. So, there is a sample uh, class which you have uh, used to model an entity by removing certain fields and uh, setting certain fields. So, all that is described in the tutorial and it has been done in the sample. So, play around with it. Okay, so I will stop here and take any more questions. So, let us see if there are any questions. Please, uh, oh chat has, uh, there were a few questions sent by chat. Let me answer those. Okay, the first question was, how do you show total participation using the dia tool? So, if you just use a line to connect two things in dia, then there is no way to make it a double line. On the other hand, in the ER module of dia, there is a connector which is shown with a double line. So, just cop, uh, select that and uh, drag and drop it into your diagram and now connect it up to the two things which to the relationship and the entity which you want to connect. And double click on that connector and it has an option which says participation which is either partial or total. If you select total, it becomes a double line. If you select partial, it stays as a single line. So, that is the way to get total participation, double lines. Okay. The next question is, give an example of a quaternary relationship. What? Ternary itself is hard enough to find and you want a quaternary with four things related. Actually, I will take this opportunity to uh, mention some situations uh, where uh, you start off with something that looks like an, an nary relationship for large n, but after a while you kind of give up and say, let me treat this as an entity instead, not as a relationship. So, 
let us take, um, uh, let us say a sports thing, let us cricket, all of us uh, enjoy cricket, well almost all of us probably. Uh, so, we have scores at the end of a game. Now, how do you model that score information, which is the scorecard, how would you model that in an ER model? Okay. So, that turns out to be a little trickier than it appears. So, if you see a scorecard, let me show it up here. So, scorecard has something like uh, batsman uh, and then there is a sequence number. So, uh, when what is the order 1, 2, 3, there is a batsman, then there is um, probably some um, thing like runs, balls, faced, then there is uh, usually in line, not as a separate column, you record how the batsman was out. So, we can split that into separate columns, uh, separate attributes, caught, which is who caught them, which could be null, which means the person was not caught at all, bold, who was the bowler and for a thumping, I do not know if the bowler even matters and then stumped or run out, say run out. Stumped, I guess, uh, means the keeper by default. So, run out by who? Who did the run out? And maybe some other st statistics, fours, sixes, and so forth. So, those are all the statistics. So, we have a table which looks like this. So, now if you see, uh, most of these are simply attributes in the table, but there are several attributes which, like batsman, um, caught, bowled, uh, run out, or stumped by whatever. These things are really uh, references to some entity, to a batsman, uh, to players. In, in general, they are references to players. So, how do we model this? Should we, uh, then there is a match of course, this whole thing is for a particular match. So, that is not part of this table, but it is, I am sorry, it is going out. So, this whole thing is for a match and innings combination. for a test you have two innings. So, all of this information exists for each match and for each innings. So, how do we model this? Should we have uh, match entities, batsman entities, bowler entities, player entities, what are all the entities which may exist? So, it is very clear that match should be an entity, nobody will doubt that. It is clear that player should be an entity. It is clear that team should be an entity. Uh, it is also, um, well, what else? What are the other things? What should be entities and relationships now? So, clearly a player plays in a match. So, maybe there is some relationship between player and match. Now, does it make sense to put all of these things as attributes of this relationship? Um, and that becomes a little messy. So, maybe uh, you can have uh, an NRE relationship um, for corresponding to one row of this scorecard. Uh, that becomes an NRE relationship uh, with uh, thing like which looks like this. This is not a good design, mind you. I am just showing what you could do. I am not saying it is a good idea. One of the edges it is called batsman, another edge is called bowler, another is caught, another is run out, and then you have uh, attributes here such as runs balls, etcetera. These are all attributes. This is one way which you, in which you could model this whole thing. Uh, there is also an innings, I will skip that for simplicity. So, you can model this row of uh, the scorecard as a relationship which goes like this, but there is a problem with this. The problem is that uh, for a particular row, maybe there is no uh, person who caught it, it was a bold, there was no caught by there was no run out. So, then you have a relationship where instead of having, so in this relationship is actually, uh, it has five entities, but it is also a bad idea, because if there is no person who did a caught or run out for a particular row of the scorecard, this will turn into a ternary relationship in that case. You cannot have relationships which keep changing their arity as you please. Uh, so, then you could go and create separate relationships, one for 
uh, the case where the batsman was bold, one was for the case where the batsman was caught and so forth. It is really messy. Uh, coming back, we continue to have an entity called a player uh, and maybe uh, we want to have a particular row of the scorecard, which could be a new entity, player innings. So, this is a particular instance where a player played uh, and that is related to player through batsman. So, that is the sorry, uh, this is slightly messed up. Let me draw it again. Batsman says that for this player innings, this was the batsman and then you can also have other relationships. All the other ones which we had, we could have had a bowler, which is another relationship. Uh, we could call it bold by to make it clear, bold by. We can have one more relationship, caught. caught by if you want to make it very explicit player and so on and so forth. You can have uh, run out and so on. And the player innings can have all the associated attributes, I uh, have not shown them here, but uh, runs, balls and so on can be attributes of this entity player innings. And that actually makes life a lot simpler. Um, so, if you see a player innings, this is for batsmen. There will be a similar one for bowler. Uh, so, maybe this is uh, batting innings perhaps. Uh, bowling innings is actually simpler because it just has uh, it, the number of overs bowled and so forth, number of wickets taken. But for the batting innings, uh, it is for a batsman. So, it must have a total relationship with batsman, which is again to one player. Bowled by need not be total. There may not be an associated bowler. He may just be stumped or caught by again, there may not be anybody, but it can be only caught by one person. You cannot be caught by two people and so forth. So, we can introduce cardinality constraints also here. And this diagram here is a lot cleaner than the uh, NRE relationship we created earlier. So, whenever you get a very large uh, you know, NRE relationship, uh, things go really messy. It is probably a bad idea. You are probably much better off turning it into an entity with separate relationships. In fact, it is uh, it's discussed in one of the exercises in the book that whenever you have a relationship, NRE relationship, you can always create an artificial entity like this. So, if I had an, let us take the ternary case E 1, E 2, E 3, an NRE relationship like this can be turned into, you create a new entity, let us say E prime and E 1 is still there. So, the instance of this relationship corresponding to that instance, we create a brand new entity and that entity is going to be related to each of the corresponding entities. So, E prime is going to have a relation with E 1, E 2 and E 3. So, this is a well known thing that an NRE relationship can be translated into a fake entity, which has a num n binary relationships with the original entity sets. So, this can always be done and in fact, we have done something like this here, uh, although in this case, it was not truly an NRE relationship. It was a worse than an NRE relationship, it was a relationship whose arity kept changing depending on the situation. Uh, so, here definitely we want to turn it into an entity, not keep it as a relationship. Okay, I hope uh, that answered that question. Uh, the last question is how to relate, how to reduce aggregation into a relational schema. Uh, I did not cover aggregation here, but for those of you who know what aggregation is, um, or I will like describe this. For those of you who do not know what is aggregation, aggregation simply lets you treat a relationship as one of the uh, kind of like an entity. So, you have a relationship which is linked to another relationship and the book has uh, some examples of that. The slides I have used here do not have that, but the book website has a more detailed set of slides and the book of course, has the examples of uh, aggregation. If you know what is an aggregation, 
how to convert it to a table is actually very simple. Um, you do not directly create a table for the aggregation, but the aggregation makes sense only if it is, has a relationship with something else. In that relationship, you need to create a primary key for the aggregation. The primary key for the aggregation is simply the collection of primary keys of all the entity sets that participate in that aggregation. Well, actually, uh, if you have cardinality constraint like many to one, maybe you can eliminate some of those keys and reduce it. But the primary keys of all the component entities of an aggregation will form a super key which you can use as the key for the aggregation. So, that is basically what you do. You do not create a table for the aggregation, it is not required um, because it does not have any attributes by itself. But the point of an aggregation is to have a relationship with the aggregation. And so, what you can do is uh, create a table for the relationship and if you do create the table, you need a primary key from the aggregation and that this is how you get the primary key. So, I hope that has answered the question. Uh, let me give a last chance for people to ask questions online. Uh, let me see if anybody has their hands up. If you have a question, please use a view and raise your hand. Varangal seems to have a question. Let me see if I can connect to you. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, my question is whether there are any restrictions on the use of outer join. So, the question is are there restrictions on the use of outer join? Not really. You can always take any two relations and uh, do an outer join between. There is no such restriction. Um, maybe you have something uh, deeper in mind. So, maybe you can ask that question in a different way. Back to you. Uh, actually, I wanted to perform uh, in, uh, a natural join between a relation and the outcome of a subquery which involves a outer join. And the outer join subquery basically involves a uh, attribute from the outside uh, attribute. And when we are referring the outer attribute, then uh, there is a problem there. So, uh, okay. I, I I think I understand the question you are asking and I think uh, that was actually answered in a slide. So, let me bring up that slide uh, that will help you understand what this is. Okay. So, I hope you can see this slide. I think this slide will answer the question I hope. So, basically you wanted to have a natural join between uh, some relation here and you wanted this subquery here which you see here to access an attribute of the outer this this relation here. Um, so, the thing to note here is when you have a subquery in the from clause, by default it cannot access any attribute of any other relation in the same from clause. It can, if it is a subquery in a where clause, it can access attributes of any relation in the from clause. A subquery in the from clause, by default cannot access attributes of any other relation in the same from clause they are all at the same level, they cannot see each other. Unless your database supports a construct called lateral, in which case you say something like this, instructor i 1 comma lateral and what lateral signifies is that the sub query immediately following it can access the um, attributes of anything to the left of it. Okay. So, this is a feature which not all databases support although it is part of the SQL standards. And if it is not supported, there is no way you can access attributes of I 1 inside here. Um, if you do wish to do this, um, you can probably rewrite the question in uh, query in some other way. It depends on the specific query. Um, now, a SQL server has a construct equal to equivalent to lateral, although they call it something else. Uh, I think they call it cross join or something like that, uh, which has effectively the same uh, uh, result as uh, the lateral clause. Uh, Oracle I think supports lateral currently in the current versions, DB2 probably does, uh, PostgreSQL does not. Okay. So, if you are using PostgreSQL, you have to re rewrite your query in some other way. I hope that answered your question. I will see if I can get back to you. Yeah, back to you Arangal. Uh, actually, uh, uh, as post GRE does not support it, I think I have to modify the query. Yes, you will have to modify the query. 
I do not have a general solution which will work for any query, but for the specific query I am sure it can be expressed. Uh, it is just a question of figuring out what you need. Okay. Thank you sir. Over to you. Okay. I think we are uh, well uh, beyond the scheduled end of the day. So, thank you very much.